The topic of today's presentation is multiple canary releases and stress test on production. Let's first start with multiple canary releases. After that, let's move to stress test in production. Let's start with the simplest case. Canary is a technique used to reduce the risk associated with releasing new versions of software. The idea is to first release a new version of the software to a small number of users and then gradually iterate through the upgrade. For example, in this diagram, we test 10% of the traffic first, then gradually move more traffic to the new version, and finally the old version is cleared and taken offline. Throughout the testing process, we can label the traffic with various business tags, such as Android devices, location of Beijing, etc. Also note that user tags should not use IP addresses, which are inaccurate and inconsistent. Then we can specify canary traffic rules to schedule route a certain part of the user's traffic to a certain canary. For example, the Android user from Beijing is scheduled to the 2.0 canary version of service A. The scenario of a single service canary is still limited. In reality, it is more common to have full stack canary testing. For example, a user client cannot be forwarded directly through the router to the canary version of the service. This is because the service is very far back in the whole chain, separated by other services. As shown in the figure, we have published canary for delivery, with user and order services spaced in between. In this case, we need to do two things to ensure that the traffic is scheduled correctly. The first is to pass through the user tags. And the second is to route traffic to the correct version of the next service at any endpoint of the chain. If you consider the implementation level a little bit here, you will notice that there are two categories of approaches to do full stack canary release, either by changing the code or by a non intrusive platform level solution. And changing the code can be very cumbersome and verbose and prone to bugs. Let's use another practical example to illustrate the difficulty of multiple canary releases. For example, there are now two services order v1.0 and email v2.0. The service order calls the service email. And the service email uses the third-party email provider Tencent provider. And we decided to add some information to the order entity as a test version for Android users only. Since the changes to the order entity affect both services which need to be changed. We added order v1.1 and email v2.1 to apply this change. Then another team decided to replace the Tencent provider with Google provider in the email service. So we added email v2.0. One to test users from Beijing only. At this time there is a dilemma that Android users and Beijing users are overlapping. Which is traffic from Android phones in Beijing. Considering the complexity of the traffic and the inconsistency felt by the users. It will lead to a heavy operation burden. Let's take one step back and analyze different cases of canary release. Let's first concentrate on the figure on the left. For example, A and B rely on Z. While it tests Android traffic and B is testing iPhone traffic, they test two different user groups. And if they both rely on Z's toe test, Z takes on two different canary traffic and will become a source of confusion. Then there are two better approaches. Seen in the figures in the middle and on the right. The first is to schedule traffic from Auto Z. And the second is to schedule traffic from on and toes and z separately. Thereby the principle to make many things easier is one canary release. One traffic rule. Even if the canary conflict problem is solved, there is still a problem that the traffic rules may overlap. The previous example is the user traffic of Android and iPhone. But if one canary tests Android and the other tests Beijing, there will be a common subset of traffic rules for both canary releases. So if the traffic is from a common subset, such as traffic from Android devices in Beijing, how should we route that traffic at this time? In fact, this ends up being a mathematical abstraction of two set problems. 1. Set matching user traffic is a set. Canary release of traffic rules is a set. 2. Multi-matching problem multiple canary traffic rules are matched on. Which one should be selected? So let's use an example to demonstrate all the problems mentioned before. For example, there is a back-end service stack of a food delivery application. 
The service consists of three microservices order service, restaurant service and delivery service. Order service has no canary. Restaurant service has two canaries. First canary is for Android traffic from Beijing and second canary is for all Android traffic. Delivery service also has two canaries. First canary is for traffic from Beijing and second is for all Android traffic. When the system receives traffic with Beijing user tag, it matches the routing rules of delivery services Beijing canary and the traffic follows the green path. Then on the other hand, the traffic with Android user tag matches the routing rules of Android canary for both restaurant and delivery. The traffic follows the blue path. But what happens for traffic that contains both Android and Beijing tags? It matches all three canaries and there is no unambiguous way route the traffic. This is how it looks in terms of sets. Since in terms of math, the canary rule is matched if canary traffic is a subset of user traffic. So how should we handle the multiple matching problem? A simple and easy way to solve this problem is to specify the priority of canary. Each traffic rule has a number indicating the priority, from small to large. As you can see from the figure, traffic Beijing and Android matches three canaries. But because restaurant Beijing and Android has the highest priority, priority 1, the red canary is therefore selected. Even though the priority solves the problem of multiple matching, there is still a problem of misused configuration, traffic shadow problem. In this example, the red rule is shadowed by the blue rule. As blue has higher priority, it means no traffic is routed to Beijing and Android Canary. Finally, let's explain the technical details of eSEMesh and give an overview of how we implement multiple Canary releases. First of all, all our services are running in Kubernetes pods. The three services in here correspond to three services in eSEMesh. And even different versions under the same service are part of one service. So a mesh service will have multiple versions running at the same time. In order to route the traffic to correct canaries, two things need to be accomplished. First thing to ensure is to pass through user tags without losing any user information throughout the service chain. This involves the sidecar and the business application. The sidecar naturally knows all the canary traffic rules and user tags, such as some specific HTTP headers, and it will forward them with the traffic. Also the business application itself needs to pass through the user tags, which can be done by our officially supported Jvagent in cooperation with Sidecar, and does not require user awareness. Sidecar will notify the Jvagent to pass through all the information. As for other languages such as Golang, since there is no BTICID technology, only a simple SDK is enough to forward the user tags. So eSEMesh also supports multiple languages in this advanced feature as long as the user tags are available. Second requirement for eSEMesh Canary releases is traffic routing. All components, including ingress controller of eSEMesh, and the sidecar in each service pod have the ability to route Canary traffic to the next service corresponding Canary version. You can see that all the service components in this figure, whether receiving requests or sending requests, will pass through the sidecar, and when sending requests outbound, the sidecar observes the traffic characteristics and decides whether the traffic needs to be dispatched to one of Canary versions of the next service. And this is all done by sidecar, without the involvement of agent and SDK. We will demo the first demo. Then we will put it on the right side and put the terminal on the right side. 在这整个里面什么都还没有部署。首先，我们先部署一下，呃，这三个 order restaurant 和 deliver， 嗯，最呃原始的版本的吧，就这三个。然后在这个部署的过程中，我们其实可以随便随便看一个呃那个 YAML 图啊，比如说我们去看这个 restaurant 的 YAML， 呃，它里面其实就是一个 deployment， 然后整个通过这个。Annotation， 比如说这个 Annotation 是我们 EaseMesh 里面注入的，我们通过 Operator 可以得知，呃，这个来的这个 Deployment 是哪一个服务，它的服务名字叫什么，后面的也是它的一些具体的一些 Java 的配置。OK， 
呃，我们这个都这个 demo 的库是开源的，大家想要看细节可以去看，就是关注一下我们的开源开源的一个 repo。OK， 这个时候我们来看一下 repo， 呃，那个 pod 的运行情况。呃，现在应该都起来了。那么我们先测试一下最主要的 primary 的流量，比如我们的给的参数，比如说我们要这个订单的 ID 是什么，然后我。呃，我去订的这个食物是一个面包，这样子，我发一个流量。刚开始会卡一些，因为 Java 启动稍微会慢一些，因为中间有一个 Restaurant 是 Java 的服务。那这个时候，它返回的这个就是，其实具体的信息和上面差不多，只不过它多了一个说，呃，我多久送到这个时间 Deliver Time 这个东西。然后这个时候，我们就想去。在整个这三个部署完了之后，也运这个流量也通过了之后，我们这个时候先部署一下这个 deliver 北京的这个 canary， 我们先把它的 pod 运行起来。大家可以看到它运行的比较快啊，就是因为，然后我们将它的这个呃灰度流量的规则，通过我们的 e a s m e s h 的统一的一个一站式的一个命令行给注入进去，在这里面。里面具体的信息，大家可以看到，我首先把它的 priority 设为三，就像我之前说的，这设为三，然后它 match 的 service 是 deliver， 然后它 instance labels 就是说是 release deliver match 北京，它这个 labels 其实就是为了区分呃 deliver 蓝色的这个部分，还有 deliver 北京这个部分，它要通过 instance labels 来区区分。那么下面呢，其实就是说它带的它它要灰度的一些流量规则，比如说在我们这儿就用。HTTP 协议里面，如果你带的 header 是 x 杠 location， 然后你的值如果是准确的是北京的话，那么我就会把这个流量灰度过去。OK， 然后我们把这个整个的流量灰度规则给 apply， 那这个时候 apply 成功了，这个时候我们来试一下北京的流量，看它有没有把新的特性给路由到。好，这个时候大家可以看到，比刚才的 deliver time。后面多了一个后缀，就是说它是在路上的时间。这个其实就是说，这个绿色的 deliver 北京，它这个流量路由到这儿才会返回这个呃 road duration， 说明我们这一步就成功了。然后第三步呢，我们想去呃想去想去部署的是蓝色的安卓的这部分，我们要新部署这两个蓝色的实例，跟刚才一样。嗯。这安卓的都已经在 run 起来了，那这个时候我们还是一样，呃，把它的那个灰度的规则一样，就是呃那个呃 priority 是 r， 然后它是需要 match 两个 service， 比如这两个 service 它都需要，然后 labels 嘛就是用这个 release 这个 refund， 等会我们它的它演示的这个新特性，其他新特性就是一个发优惠券的一个东西，然后它匹配的这个路由规则呢，就是说。带一个 X Phone OS 是安卓，那么如果是这样的流量的话，它是蓝色的流量，只会指这一条线。我们把这个应用上去 ，OK， 这个时候已应用成功了。我们来看一下安卓的流量，这是我带的这个安卓的头，看它会返回什么结果。大家可以看到，比刚才又多了一个 field， 就是 Q p a n 返回的是，比如说五呃五五块钱啊。这个其实就是蓝色的两个配合的返回的一个新特性 ，OK， 说明这蓝色的这条线也成功了。那第四步呢，就是我们会去部署这个红色的那个一样的，就是说呃 ，Restaurant 它要去测北京且安卓的流量。嗯，我们看一下，嗯，这个时候应该也部署成功了，在这儿。那、呃、跟刚才一样，我们会把这个灰度规则也呃通过我们的 e a s h 的命令行给注入进去。它的呃优先级是一，然后它 match 的 service 就是这个 restaurant， 然后它的 release 是 re restaurant match 北京安卓，其实就是这个实例了。OK， 这个时候已经 apply 成功了。这个时候我们来测一下呃北京和安卓的流量，看它返回什么结果。好。这个时候，大家记得刚才返回的是 road duration， 其实是绿色的这个。然后这一次它返回的是一个 cook duration， 就是说我我饭店需要准备多少时间
呃，它其实就是说，经过红色这条线，这个红色这条线它返回的是这个 cook duration， 说明红色这条线也如这个图一样，正确的走走走到了这个 canary。那么这一页的 demo 其实就是到这儿，我们整个这几条线都是走我们想走的。那么像我们刚才说的，它有可能会出现这个呃 traffic shadow 的问题，就比如说我们将蓝色的和红色的这两个 canary 的 priority 给。呃，翻转一下，比如说我们现在将那个呃，北京且安卓的 restaurant， 我把它改成二 ，OK， 这个改成二。那么我们再把整个安卓的蓝色的部分改成一，他们两个的 priority 就正好切换了一下。那这个时候呢，我们再去看。我们来测试一下所有流量吧，把所有流量来看一下。比如说，我们还是最正常的流量，什么 canary 的特性都不带，嗯，还是正常，它什么都没有，就跟以前一样。那么我们再测一下北京，北京嘛，就按这个图的话，它还是走绿色的，它也不影响。比如它返回的是呃 road duration， 这个是绿绿色的部分。那我们再测一下安卓的部分，其实安卓也跟上一张图没没有改变，因为它还是。本来也应该走蓝色的部分，虽然它的优先级提高了。嗯、你看，返大家看可以看到，返回的是这个优惠券的部分，优优惠券的 fail 的，说明它的蓝色这条线，呃，是没问题的。然后最重要的就是说，我们改变优先级之后，这个北京且安卓的这个流量，它到底如果是走这个的话，它返回的就是饭店，饭店那个需要的时间。但如果我们现在发这个请求，它返回的是跟上一个请求一样，返回的是优惠券的话，那它走的是这个图这一条路线就被屏蔽掉了。我们看一下它的结果 ，OK， 可以看到就是说它返回的是优惠券，所以它就是被这个安卓的这个 Canary 给屏蔽掉了。这也是大家要在实践的过程中要注意，就是这个它这个集合更大的把集合更精确的给屏蔽掉。嗯，大概就是这样。我们整个 demo 其实就是就是这样子。嗯，好。Let's now summarize the design principles of the platform and the best practices for its operation. Design principles are following: one, one canary service version can belong to at most one canary release. Two, one request only can be scheduled to at most one canary release. Three, the canary release must be explicitly selected by incoming traffic. Four, normal traffic that does not match Canary rules goes through primary deployments. Here's also few best practices. One, tagging the traffic must use the user side information. For example, a client IP address is not a good way. Two, when tagged traffic overlaps, use explicit priority to guide the traffic router. Three, the smaller scope Canary rule has a higher priority. This is all I wanted to show you today about multiple canary releases. Let's now move on to stress test in production. Now is the full stack stress test part. The topic of this part is how to do stress testing in a production environment. Today's production environment has become very, very complex. Just like the picture on the right, there are many components in it, ranging from dozens or hundreds to thousands. And these components are developed by different development teams and in different languages, which makes the communication between them very complicated. No one can tell the relationship between all of them. The complexity, from a technical point of view, makes debugging difficult. In addition, the business has also changed a lot. For example, during the Black Friday promotion, the traffic pressure on the online shopping systems is dozens or even hundreds of times higher than usual. In order to know in advance whether our system can withstand such a high traffic load, we need to perform a full stack stress test to get the real performance figures. But also due to the complexity mentioned above, it is very challenging to perform full stack stress testing in today's systems. Now let's look at the problem of traditional stress test methods. The first is to build a test environment identical to the production environment for stress testing. In the era of standalone applications. This is a very good solution, but in the age of the internet, there are at least two problems. The first is money. We can count how many servers there are in our production environment, and then how much we need to spend to buy these servers. And that's just the cost for servers. 
The cost will be higher when counting other hardware. Most companies should not be able to afford such a test environment. Even if duplicating the cloud resources for the test environment is not an issue. Is it enough to get reliable results? I think the answer is still no. Because it is difficult for our test environment to be exactly the same as the production environment. There are several reasons first. Because it is a test environment. People will continue to deploy test versions to it, but forget to restore it after the testing. Over time, the test environment will become more and more different from the production environment. The second is that many development teams will share this test environment. And if there's not an excellent coordination mechanism, the tests conducted by different teams will also affect the test results. But the real trouble is the data. That is, how to ensure that the data used in the test is completely consistent with the production environment. For example, in a Twitter-like system, users like me generally only have a few dozen or hundreds of followers. So it will be fairly easy to notify all my followers in a second when I post a message. But for a celebrity with millions of followers, the situation will be very different. Therefore, we cannot simply use simulated data for testing. The second point is the proportion of different users. Users like me may account for 90%. And celebrities may only be one in hundreds of thousands. Only by simulating the proportion of users with different degrees of followers can we get a reliable test result. The easiest way is to take the production data to the test system for testing. But it also brings the problem of data security. The production data generally contains a lot of sensitive information. The risk of data leakage will increase exponentially if they are brought to the test environment. Because of these issues, People turn their eyes to the production environment and try to use the low traffic period of the production environment for testing. But it's also a huge challenge because it is an intrusive solution that involves modifying or even redefining business logic. Let's take an example. Assuming it is an online shopping system, including a user module and an order module. To test it, we need to modify these modules. First, we need to add test logic. And then we need to add the logic to detect whether we are in a test or not. This looks very simple. Just requires adding some if else. But is much more complicated in practice. First of all, what exactly does test mean? And for what kind of request? We can think of it as a test request. For the user module, we might be able to do this by adding a special prefix to the ID of test users or specifying a range of user, it's in advance. This should do the trick. When the request comes to the order module, we may still want to use the user ID to determine whether the test logic should be taken. But the actual situation may be after a series of complex processing. The user ID has been discarded. So the order module cannot see it at all. Then, how to write the judgment logic? The second question is how our test logic differs from production logic. It's easier for us to think about accessing different datasets. Or simulating a third-party service such as payments because we don't want to actually spend money on testing. But what is really complicated is preparing data for subsequent components. This relates to the first problem. That is because the order module cannot see the user ID. The user module needs to mark the request sent to the order module so that the order module knows this is a test request. However, in a complex system, it is not easy for the user module to know all the modules that the subsequent process will go through. So we have to spend a lot of effort to ensure the test state is correctly transmitted between modules to avoid disturbing the production logic. Please notice this is just the work required for one function point. And there are thousands of function points in a normal system. So, the big question here is how much effort it takes to do all of these modifications. And a bigger question is, who can guarantee that all the changes that should be made have been made? And if these are omissions or errors? The production data will be corrupted. How to solve these problems? We believe that the key lies in isolation. Which is to isolate the production system and the test system from the four dimensions of business. Data, traffic, and resources to prevent them from affecting each other. Business isolation means that we should not use the form of adding conditional judgments to decide whether to use production logic or testing logic. But to distinguish them clearly from the beginning. Data isolation means the same copy of data cannot be accessed both by the production system and the test system. Traffic isolation means that normal requests and test requests can only enter the corresponding system. The resources in resource isolation mainly refer to hardware. For example, 
The test system and the production system cannot be deployed on the same server, so as not to compete for hardware resources such as CPU and memory. This is mainly a hardware issue, but Kubernetes has given a very good solution at the software level. Let's take a look at the solutions given by EaseMesh. First, because EaseMesh is implemented based on Kubernetes. It achieves resource isolation with the help of Kubernetes. For business isolation, EaseMesh can replicate existing services, except for adding a shadow mark. The replicated copy is exactly the same as the original one. And EaseMesh can replace the connection information of various middleware including Miskel, Kafka, Redis, etc. according to the configuration, and thus change the target of data requests, thereby realizing data isolation. When creating a service copy, EaseMesh also automatically creates a canary rule to forward the request with the x-mesh-shadow header to the replicated service copy as a test request and forward other requests to the original service to achieve traffic isolation. The above three isolations are implemented by the shadow service feature of EaseMesh. It should be noted that canary is also a feature of EaseMesh. The canary in the figure only means that shadow service will automatically deploy a canary rule. In addition to shadow service, we also need another feature of EaseMesh to make a full stack stress test possible. Mock, because we cannot replicate some third-party services for testing, such as the payment service mentioned above. We need to mock it. Now take a look at what will be demonstrated today. This is a scenario where a user uses a coupon. We can find there are three services in it. The first is coupon service. The second is user service. And the third is verification code service, which will send a verification code to the user's mobile phone. And coupon service. User service has their own database middlewares. The entire system is deployed in Kubernetes. And you should have found that our traffic entry is mesh ingress. And there is a Java agent and a sidecar with each service in the system. Which means that these services are also subject to the management of Ease Mesh. The Java agent is mainly to hijack various requests sent by the application. Including both HTTP requests and requests to middlewares. Sidecar is implemented based on EaseGress. It is mainly for various processing of traffic. And also for things like service discovery. Monitoring. And tracing. It is this management of EaseMesh that makes it possible for us to hijack various requests sent by applications to achieve the aforementioned business isolation, data isolation, and traffic isolation for stress testing. In this system, when a user request comes in, it will first go to our mesh ingress, then to the coupon service, and the coupon service will send a request to the user service to verify the user's identity. And then, if it passes, to the verification code service, Send a request to send a verification code to the user. So let's look at the steps we need to take for a stress test. As a first step, we need to replicate the two database middleware. We can simply back up the databases and then restore them. And we do not need to do any desensitization processing on the data. Because all our data is still in the same security domain as the original system. Simply backing up and restoring does not increase security risks. After the middlewares are replicated, the second step is to replicate services through the shadow service and automatically deploy a canary rule. As we can see, the coupon service and user service have now been replicated, and during the process, we have also rewritten their connection to the middlewares through the sidecar and Java agent, allowing them to access the replicated middlewares instead of the production middlewares. This rewritten can be done through the configuration of the shadow service, or through the confi map of Kubernetes. For the test traffic, we will add an x slash mesh slash shadow header to it. Any request with this header goes to the replicated services according to the canary rules we just deployed. Following the orange lines. And the normal user requests still go to the production services. That is, follow the blue lines. Now we have the coupon service and user service replicated. But haven't the verification code service because it will eventually call a third party service to send the verification code to the user's mobile phone. Although the cost of each verification code message is not very high, if we send a lot of requests in the test, it is also a big cost. Therefore, we hope not to send the verification code. This requires the mock feature we mentioned just now to mock the verification code instead of replicating it directly. Generally speaking, 
We need to mock services like payment because their implementation is complex, involving various verifications and encryptions, which make them difficult to mock. Therefore, we need to make a service in our system to wrap these third-party services. Because these wrapper services are inside our system, we can make the interface simpler by saving a lot of security verifications. So, what we actually mock during testing is the wrapper services, not the real third-party services. Now let's start the demonstration. I prepared two scripts for today's demonstration. One on the left and one on the right side of my screen. With a shadow suffix after the philenum on the right side. Now I will run these two scripts. We can see that the output on both sides is exactly the same. In a while. I will also show the topography generated by our mega cloud system. From the graph. We can also see that the processing process of the two requests is exactly the same. But because Mega Cloud requires a little time to sync data, let's take a look at the content of these two scripts first. We can see these two scripts are exactly the same, except that the right side carries the X dash mesh dash shadow header when sending each request. These two scripts execute the get token at the beginning because the demo system requires a user to log in first. After getting the token, they start sending the get coupon request. We will also take a look at the Kubernetes to check the pods. We can see four services from the pods information. We will focus on three of them. The coupon, user, and verification code services. Let's execute the EaseMesh control command of EaseMesh again to take a look at the shadow service in the system. We can see that no resource is returned. That is, we have not deployed any shadow service yet. Now the data synchronization of Mega Cloud should have been completed. Let me refresh the page. As you can see from this picture, although the requests with and without shadow have both been sent just now, we can only see one execution path in this picture. That is, coupon service calls user service and calls verification code service. At the same time, the coupon service and user service will also access the two middleware miscal and readies. Now I will deploy the shadow services. Please note, in the slides, we say replicating the middleware is the first step. But for this demonstration, I prepared the middleware replicas in advance. And in order to show the difference, I revise the replicated data. But in practice, we can just replicate the production data directly without any modification. Now let's create the shadow service. Just run the M control apply command. We can see it says that both the coupon shadow service and the user shadow service have been created successfully. Now run the cube control command again. We can see that there are two more pods in the system namely coupon shadow and user shadow. And if we run the M control get shadow service command again, we can also see that there are two more shadow services in the system. However, although we see that both pods are already in the running state, it still takes a little time for our application to start. About a minute to two. So let's take this time to see the content of the YAML file we just used to create the shadow services. As we can see, there are two shadow services. The first one is named coupon shadow service. And the second one is user shadow service. Which are shadow copies of coupon service and user service respectively. And as mentioned before, our service supports rewriting the configuration of the middleware directly. We can also see this from this YAML. In the spec of each shadow service, we have rewritten the connection information for MISCAL and Redis. In this way, we replace the middleware access by these two shadow services. It should be ready now. Let's execute the command and check the result. Since it is a Java application, the first execution takes slightly more seconds. Okay, now the result is out. For a better comparison, I will clear the screen and then run the commands again. As you can see, the difference is that the coupon name field has changed from Chinese to English. 
This is the result of modifying the database connection. The data in the database is different, indicating that they are accessing different databases. Let's take a look at the topology of the system. Now let me refresh the page. We can see that there are some gray nodes in the system, which are the replicas of the original service and middleware, including coupon service, user service, miscal, and readies. And the middlewares being accessed by the two replicated services are also the replicated ones. The only problem now is that these two coupon services, the original coupon and the replica, both access the same verification code service. Because we haven't mocked the verification code service yet, let's do it now. The M control apply command again. This mocks the verification code service. Now let's execute the command with shadow again. You can see that the verification code becomes ABCD. And when executing the command without shadow, the verification code is still 123,456. Let's take a look at the content of the YAML file. We can see that the request path is first matched. And then, Request with header x-mesh-shadow will be matched. After a complete match, it directly returns the HTTP status code 200 and verification code ABCD. Well, now that all our preparations are complete, let's actually conduct a stress test because it is a demo environment. So don't expect particularly high performance. Let's change this test script and replace the last get coupon command with an AB command. Let's use 10 concurrent connections and send 2000 requests to see what the performance of this demo system looks like. A little bit slow. Maybe I should send fewer requests. Finally, we get the result. Request per second is 125. This is a system that needs to be optimized for performance. Now let's check the execution path through the topology graph. Since our topology graph aggregates data based on time, I need to adjust the time range a bit to only use data after we apply the mock. As we can see now, the line from the replicated coupon service to the verification code service is gone, indicating that there is no calling between them now. That's all for our demo today. Back to slides. What advantages does our shadow service have over traditional testing methods? I think there are five points. First, zero code changes. Everything is done through configuration. No code modification is required. And no new bugs. Second, low cost in the case of using a cloud server. The hardware resources used for testing can be applied before the test and released after. And we only need to pay for the actual usage period. Third, clean environment except for a few services that are mocked. The test system is completely consistent with the production system, which avoids errors caused by differences in business logic to the greatest extent. Fourth, true data. The data of the test system and the production system are completely consistent, which ensures the reliability of the test results. Fifth, secure. Although the production data is used in the test, the test system and the production system are in the same security domain. So there is no increased risk of data leakage. That's all for today's sharing. Welcome to follow our open source project on GitHub. And also welcome to join our open source community. Thanks.